I get that, but it's going to stay in the general area.
travels while we were gone. We had a fantastic vacation. It's nice to be back. And I wanted you to know that I ran into a gentleman while I was there that I've known ever since I've known Alan. And he listens to, um, during the season when the choir is singing, he goes on YouTube to listen to our choir every Sunday. And that's kind of special to me because I don't get a lot of that when I'm there. You know, not, they're not a big church-going community or family. And this guy sings in his church choir. And uh, my brother-in-law has given him our website and, and information, and so he goes on every Sunday and listens to that and says it looks like we have a warm and wonderful church, and I assure him that that is true. So it's nice to be back. So. Would you please stand as you're able for our opening song, the Church is Worth Foundation.
we likewise lift them up not only today but throughout the week. This board has already shared the yellow cards are great for registering your attendance and help us tremendously. You can also register any additional prayer requests you might have. And one of the announcements that you made, I hope that you'll give prayerful consideration to in reading with students at the elementary school. It's a true blessing and an opportunity for us to reach out into our community in a significant way. And if you have an interest, um, please put that on the yellow card as well, and we'll make sure that we get back to you very quickly. The altar is always open if we'd like to come in a time of prayer, or praise, whatever that might be. We're going to enter into our prayer time as we sing our prayer song, Bless Me, the Tide of Bonds.
today is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 15. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to thank Courtney last week for bringing the message and Pastor Jim for making sure that the hospitals and folks were covered and very thankful for your willingness to do those things. Please pray with me. Praise God, we give you thanks and praise for your word. We thank you, God, for the many ways that you speak to us, not only individually, but together through it. We pray that by your Holy Spirit you would speak your truth and you to us. We pray, O oh God, that truly you help us to hear you speak your word to us this day, especially concerning resentment and how we might deal with it and even get it out of our lives. Now, hide me behind the cross of your Son, Jesus, O oh God, with it. And everything that is said and done, you might be seen, and you will be heard, you will be glorified. So I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of a man who was bitten by a dog who later discovered that the dog was a rabbit, and he contracted rabies. Now, this happened at a time when absolutely nothing could be done. And so the doctor came to him and gave to him the bad news that he had rabies and that he really needed to get all of his affairs in order. He said, I would start to do whatever you need to do because your time is not going to be very long. The dying man sank into a depression at first and sank into a shock, but finally rallied enough strength where he asked for a pen and paper and he began writing furiously. An hour later when the doctor returned, he saw the man's pen still flowing over the paper. And the doctor said to him, well, it's good to see that you've taken my advice. I take it that you're working on a will. This ain't no will, Doc, the man said. It's a list of people that I plan on biting before I die. <laughs> Now, if you ask anyone who gardens, 
or anyone who tries to take very good care of their lawn. They'll tell you how extremely difficult it is to get rid of weeds once they set root. They move in and they begin to choke out all of the beautiful grass, all of the beautiful flowers, to choke out the garden and completely overrun it. This is exactly what resentment does. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is telling us we need to be careful about. You see, our temptation oftentimes is to take the posture of just leaving bitterness alone and try to ignore it. But just like the weeds that creep in, we might first ignore them. And some of us maybe, and I know I have, have said, you know, what, what's the wrong with the weeds? They're green, so let's just let them grow. They might be green, but we know what they're going to do eventually. And the same is true with resentment. It will poison absolutely everything and choke all of the joy out of our lives. We might get by with ignoring it at first, but sooner or later, it's going to spread. It's going to spread into our marriages, into our families, into our relationships. Yes, it can even spread into the church. And even with our relationship with God. It chokes out. It chokes out whatever it touches. Psychologists tell us that the weed of bitterness is cultivated at a great price. Whenever we choose to hold on to our resentment, we relinquish, they say, control of our future. We trade the freshness of the new day and all of the possibilities it holds for us for the pain of the past. All too often what happens is we allow resentment to eat away at our hearts one bite at a time, slowly but surely. And oftentimes what we find is that that resentment is about someone or something that happened a long time ago that perhaps they have no idea that we even still have this resentment. Or they don't even realize that they've had that kind of effect on our lives. Resentment, it has been said, is swallowing poison and waiting for the other person to die. When we opt to claim the bitterness, it ultimately disrupts all of life and causes us the most harm. Truth be known, I don't think any of us want to live that way. If we could see it in advance, we'd do almost anything to do away with resentment or to steer clear of it. What we need to understand is that it's only the godly remedy of forgiveness that will remove this resentment from our lives. So how do we go about dealing with resentment? What can we do? There are some steps that we can take to resisting resentment. One is this. Think it through. Think it through. Why is it that most people harbor resentment against others? It's believed that resentment affords people a sense of superiority over the people they resent. Resentment plays an angry, places an angry individual in the judgment seat, pounding the gravel. It makes them the judge, the jury, and the executioner. It's been said there's a sense of power. There's a sense of power in fantasizing the execution of what seems in our imagination at least to be justice. With every new episode of our inner fantasies, the story grows better. The antagonist grows more evil. The punishment becomes more dramatic. That person gets what's coming to them. Someone has said that our fantasies of bitterness bring about neurotic pleasure and religious pride. In our minds, at least, we are both high 
and mighty. So the first thing we need to do then is to simply think it through. Is this resentment, is this resentment that we're carrying really making us feel all that much better? Is it solving any problems? Or is it possibly creating more? Is this the kind of life that we really want to lead? Is this the direction that we really would like to go? Is this what we want to be thinking about all of the time? Is this a fitting use of our emotional energy? We need to think it through. Another is write it down. Write it down. It's been said one of the most useful gifts God gave us is the talent to operate a pen on paper. We can use it in prayer. We can use it to preserve memories. We can use it to encourage others. We can also use it to organize our thoughts and our feelings. When we write our thoughts and feelings down, it becomes an opportunity for us to bring those feelings out as we put them on paper where we can get a really good look at them. Sometimes we might have them rolling around in our heads, but when we write them down, then we see them. And maybe they even become more real for us. As we bring them into light, we might even be surprised at what we see. It could turn out that this thing, this person, this situation isn't worth all the emotional energy that we've been expending as we look at it right there in black and white. Often we come to realize that the enemies, as we perceive them, don't even know what they've done. When we write it down, we find that words have a way of bringing precision to vague feelings. They crystallize our thoughts and show us what lies beneath. When we write it down, it becomes a way for us to bring our bitterness out of the dark and into the light. And as we do write down our thoughts and feelings, it's important for us to remember that we need to do it carefully, we need to do it prayerfully, and we need to do it honestly so that we can begin to honestly deal with it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone else has to see it. Oftentimes it's just for us. We can write it down, deal with it, and destroy it. And move on. Another is work it out. Work it out. There's a story of a couple who managed to stay married for 50 years. At the anniversary party, someone asked for their secret. And the husband said this. We made a simple agreement when we were married. Whenever she was bothered about something, she would go ahead, tell me off, and get it out of her system. As for me, every time I got angry, I should go out and take a walk. He concluded, I guess you can attribute our marital success to the fact that I have largely led an outdoor life. <laughs> In a very real sense, there's a point there. There is something to be said for a good physical exercise. In fact, it's been written. There is no full physiological solution to what is a spiritual problem. Let's be very clear on that. But a little perspiration is beneficial for strong emotions. It takes the edge off of fresh anger. It provides an outlet. It becomes an escape valve, if you will, so that we do not build up a backlog of bitterness. The call is for us to not sit in a dark room and brood, but rather to go out and take a vigorous walk. Do something to sweat away some of those emotions. And I can tell you that it works. I worked on a church staff quite some time ago. And at one time, fortunately it worked through, but there was some real turmoil in the midst 
of the staff, not the congregation, in the midst of the staff. And the administrative assistant that we had there knew exactly what I was talking about when I would say, I am going for a walk. <laughs> and don't ask me when I'll be back because I'm not sure. And I would go out and I would walk and I would pray. And I would talk it through with God. And yeah, I got some exercise in and I found that by the time I got back, I was not feeling the same way that I was when I left the building. Did it change the situation? Not always, not necessarily, but it changed me. It changed the way that I looked at a situation and helped me to deal with that bitterness and resentment. Another is talk it over. Talk it over. We can discuss our feelings with trusted friends. And this is where especially accountability groups, share groups are extremely helpful. Where we can talk these things over with folks that we know understand confidentiality and will keep in trust what we share with them. We can discuss with them our families, our Friends, we can discuss situations, we can discuss just about anything that is going on in our lives. But most importantly, we need to make sure that not only do we do that and have those kind of folks in our life, but we need to be sure that we talk those feelings over with the one who loves us most, God himself. The one who has the power to make us, our minds and our hearts, brand new. We need to go to the Lord and we need to talk with Him about what it is we're feeling. Not that He doesn't know, but oftentimes it helps us in the midst of that process. And we know that no matter what it is we have to share, whenever we have to share it, He's always more than ready to listen to us, more ready than we are to share with Him. We need to be just as honest with God as we were on the paper. For some people that's hard to do, but we need to be authentic when we're talking to God in prayer. We need to be open and honest with our feelings before God. And again, it's not that He doesn't already know. There's something that happens when we can be open and honest, not only with God, but in the midst of that process, we're open and honest with ourselves. If you're furious, if you're remorseful, if you're frantic, if you're sorrowful, whatever the motion may be, we need to bring it to God. Come as you are. We need to remember that it's not as if we have, again, something to hide, because we don't. We need to share it with Him and allow Him to help us to break loose of that resentment, this giant of resentment that wants to get its hold on us. There's a story of two men who were traveling through the jungles of Burma. One a visitor and the other a resident missionary. Along their journey, they came to a murky little pond. When the two men emerged on the far side, the visitor was covered with leeches all over his arms and his legs and his torso, and he began frantically plucking at the parasites, trying to pull them off. But the missionary said, no, 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 don't do that. If you pull one out suddenly, <clears throat> a part of the creature will remain under your skin, and the wound will become infected, and you'll be in much worse condition. The other man said, then what am I supposed to do? He said, we need to get you into a balsam bath as quickly as possible. Soaking yourself in the bath will cause those leeches to pull out their hooks, and you will be free. It's been said that deep resentment is the leech, if you will, that embeds itself in your heart and in your very soul. You cannot pluck at it and discard it simply by making a resolution, by reading a book or some other simple action. 
But there is one thing, there is one thing that you can do, I can do, that we can do, and that is to bathe in the luxurious grace of God. When we do that, when we do that, a lot of the strongholds begin to loosen within our spirits. When we contemplate the forgiveness that God has given to us, when we contemplate and we look at and we begin to experience God's mercy in our lives, we begin to understand that we are set free from this giant of resentment. And all of a sudden, that giant begins to disappear. It simply comes down to this. We can forgive because God has forgiven us. If you've not accepted God's forgiveness for your sin, you're going to struggle to forgive others. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said? See to it. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. No one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We need to talk to God. We need to ask Him to help us to see the depth of His love, of His grace, of His mercy, of His forgiveness. And not only to see it, but asking God to help us to experience it. And finally, give it up. Give it up. This becomes for us the most crucial and important step of them all. We need to give it up and let go of the bitterness and the resentment that we far too often want to hang on to. There were two little boys who had a quarrel as they were playing ball one day. Johnny slammed through the kitchen door and told his mother he'd never have anything to do with Bobby again. And yet the very next day, there he was on his way out the door with his ball glove in hand and said to his mom, I'll be over at Bobby's. I thought you were through with Bobby forever. That's what you said yesterday. And little Johnny said to his mom, oh, mommy and Bobby, we're good forgetters. <laughs> we're good forgetters. Friends, in a very real <coughs> respect, the call is for us to be good forgetters. Good forgetters. But too often that's not the case. Is we want to hold on to that resentment. We want to continue to stew over it. I don't want to let you off the hook. I like feeling this way. I want you to feel bad. But the problem is, oftentimes they're not feeling bad. We are. The only way that we can begin to allow that to happen is to be good forgetters and to let it go. If we look at the Lord's Prayer, we find there that there's only one part of it that is repeated, and it's the part about forgiveness. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And then, at the end of that prayer, we find Jesus saying this. If you forgive people their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive people their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We need to understand that as we approach the Father, it's necessary for us to release those grudges, to let go of that resentment. And the only way that we can allow that to happen and have that happen is to allow God's grace to redeem us and to set us free and to make us new. God's more than ready to do that. The question is, are we ready for Him to do that in our lives and to allow Him to do that in our lives. Paul in his letter to the Ephesians says this in Ephesians 4.32 Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, 
forgiving one another. Forgiving one another just as God in Christ also forgave you. You see, friends, life is so much easier when we allow God to lift the burden of resentment from us, to release us from this giant of resentment. We will experience so much more joy in our lives when we're not weighed down by this giant who wants to do a piggyback ride on us. Resentment if we're not careful. Resentment if we're not careful. It can break apart families. It can break apart communities, relationships. Can tear apart our community, our country, our world. It becomes that which sinks its teeth into countless souls of those who walk among us so that lives that might have been productive, lives that might have been a blessing, become consumed by self destructive resentment that can even become. Hatred. It's that which keeps us from the goodness of God. It keeps us from being faithful, loving parents, children, neighbors, and servants of God. The call, the call is for us, for you, for me, to claim anew God's love and God's grace that sets us free. And that's what we come to celebrate this morning in Holy Communion. God's grace that redeems us and sets us free. And makes us new. Helps us to experience the wonder and the power of His forgiveness through His Son, Jesus Christ. That sets us free to forgive others. And to release us from this giant of resentment. You see, friends, the choice is yours. The choice is mine. The choice is ours. And the choices that we make will make all the difference in how we live our lives. And the impact that they will have. Make every effort. Make every effort. To live in peace. With everyone. And to be holy. Without holiness no one will see the Lord. See to it. See to it. That no one misses, no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble in the final man. We will pray with me. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise. But through your Son, Jesus Christ, we can experience your grace and your mercy. That we can be set free from our sins. That we can be made new. And we give thanks, O oh God, for that grace that also plays a very real role in our relationship, not only with you, but with each other. And we pray forgiveness this day, O oh God, for those times when we have allowed the giant of resentment to overtake us and to even rule the day in our lives. Help us, we pray, to be set free from this giant once and for all as we not only open ourselves up to your grace, but pray that that grace would not only flow in us, but through us by the power of your Holy Spirit. That we might live our lives in such a way that we Share that grace that helps others find forgiveness and renewal as well in you. We thank you for this blessed sacrament that calls us to remember all that Jesus has done for us, that we might be partakers of that grace. We pray, O oh God, that you would bless these elements and we who come to now partake of them. May this truly be a time of redemption, of renewal. May this be a time of grace. For truly you make us new in your son Jesus. Hear our prayer now we pass it. In Jesus' name.
to invite the communion stewards to begin to come forward. This is an open communion. It's open to many and all who would receive anew the wonder of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. We're going to be receiving communion in the pews. We'll be distributing the elements. We'd ask that you would hold them until we've all received them that we might our faith. Yes. <coughs>
Likewise, Jesus took the cup that night, not any cup, but the cup of redemption, and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my blood, it's the blood of the new covenant that is shed for each and every one of you, so that you might know that your sins are forgiven, that you might know newness of life. He said, take a drink, and as often as you do, remember me, we drink the cup and remember it's of Christ. Again, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise for your grace that makes us new. It calls us into relationship with you as well as with each other. Help us, we pray, to be channels of that grace, that that grace might flow in and through us and all that we do by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name.